Hello, and thank you for joining the Business Operations Educational Conference as a part of the 2021 Virtual Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference. My name is Todd Carlisle. I'm an area director for the University of Georgia Small Business Development Center, and it's my pleasure today to moderate today's presentation. As we start, a couple of things I want you to be aware of. This presentation is being pre-recorded to help reduce in those te technical difficulties. However, we will do a live Q&A session after the presentation. So as you work through the presentation and questions begin to arise, please take an opportunity to type those questions to the questions box and press send, and we will be answering those questions as we work through the presentation. Also, please take a need to thank the 2021 Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Sponsors and Exhibitors. Visit the virtual trade show as well as the products pavilion. And if you're like me, one of the things I enjoy the most at conferences is being able to network with everyone. So we've got a couple opportunities for you to do that. We do the morning coffee chats beginning at 8.15, as well as after the evening receptions, networking will begin at 5.00. PM. Also, it is my pleasure to introduce the topic and today's speaker. The topic we're going to be talking today is the power of a plan for your family and your business. And I know in my experience, and I'm sure yours, especially with everything that's gone on recently, planning is a critical part of success for your family and for your business. We know that sometimes things change because of certain situations, but when you are planning, you're able to identify those contingency plans and things that help you think through the entire process, whether it be for your family or for your business. So I'm excited about today's presentation. I hope you are. Now it's my opportunity and my privilege to introduce Taylor Haley to you, who's an attorney with the Compass Law Group. Taylor, is an attorney focused on helping families with their estate planning and business needs. She's also a native of South Georgia, a business owner herself, the mother of four children, and a wife of a business owner who's also a member of this group, Morning Bell Farms. And so with all that experience, you know that Taylor understands the issues that are facing farmers in this conference and is excited and happy to guide them through the sometimes uncharted territory and the topic of estate and business succession planning. So without further ado, Taylor, we'd love to, we're excited to hear from you and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Todd, so much for that warm introduction. Um, I have been to this conference in person for five years um, with my husband and uh, it's always fun to come to Savannah and it's usually around my birthday. My birthday is January 5th, so I've always combined it with a little birthday getaway for myself. So. Um, even though we're not gonna be all together in person, this uh, conference has become a special thing uh, for us. And so I'm privileged to have this opportunity to talk to you today about a topic that I'm very comfortable with, but I know a lot of people are squirming in their seat thinking about this, because this is usually one of those things you know you need to deal with, but you don't want to. Um, and I find that the easiest way to talk about these things that are uh, feel like awkward conversations is just to add a little humor, keep it light, and just talk direct. So we're going to do some straight talking. I'm going to maybe tell you some things you didn't know, um, maybe confirm some suspicions you had, and hopefully give you some good food for thought. But just a little bit of background on myself so you wonder why in the world am I even listening to this lady. Um, like Todd said, I am from South Georgia. My husband farms. He has an electrical company. He also has an HVAC company. And I've operated my own law firm. Um, so we are small business owners, just like you. And we are parents. And, you know, we have aging parents. And we all the things that you deal with, we deal with on a personal level. Um, and my the beginning of my career, really, I spent the first first 15 years of my career in litigation. So I was in the courtroom, I was fighting disputes. A lot of those disputes were business disputes and disputes related to estates and to trust. So I tell people, I have seen the bad and the ugly. So this is why putting the good in place is really important to me. And so 
as I go through my presentation today, I use a lot of stories to try to illustrate some of the points because y'all didn't go to law school for a reason. Um, so I'm not going to try to take you to law school. I'm going to try to tell you some stories and help you um, understand why um, having a plan for your family and your business is a really powerful tool um, for success for many generations. So just to give you kind of a heads up, I'm going to start out talking more about your personal estate planning. So the planning that you or your family would need to do, whether you owned a business or you were in farming or not. I'm just going to kind of talk about this and that knowledge going to apply to most of you, but it also may apply to some other people. A lot of people hear my presentations and they're like, oh, I need to tell my daughter about this or, you know, so-and-so. Um, so that first part will be kind of general estate planning. And then the second part, I'm going to focus really on succession planning specific for ag. Um, so we're going to dive right in, but I just want to kind of give you a heads up if you're wondering when is she ever going to get to anything related to farming and agriculture. Uh, it's kind of going to be in two halves a little bit. So let's jump in. All right. So why did you come today? Um, so you're all thinking in your heads. You have your own reasons. These reasons are personal. Um, sometimes it's about your business. Sometimes it's about some of you have health care concerns, um, you know, your will, whatever. You all have reasons why you came today. So I want you to kind of think about those reasons. Maybe get out a piece of paper and start writing down what are some of the things that really bug you and that you want to get solved. Um, a lot of times these things scare us because we keep them in our head too much. So we're going to try to give you some action steps today to start thinking. Um, and that starts with just what are your concerns and your needs. So maybe it's about your family. Maybe your concerns about are about your own comfort, healthcare wise, those end of life decisions. Um, and you, or you're just seeking total assurance. You just want to have a lot of your questions answered. You've heard some horror stories or you've walked through some things with your family or um, and you just want assurance that, you know, things are going to work the way you want them to when that time comes. So maybe you're thinking about your assets, um, whether that's money, your land, your farm, you know, your business, life insurance. You want peace of mind as to how your assets are structured, how they're titled, the way it's going to go. Um, and you just want things, you might have an idea of the way things are going to work, but you want someone to assure you um, the way that it's actually going to happen. Maybe you have a lot of questions about tax. You know, we had a big change in the election this year, and the you know tax situation is very much um, up in the air. So maybe you're you know thinking about that. Maybe you're thinking about self care. You've walked through this with your parents or other relatives. You know, you want to know that it's your body and it's your choices that are going to be honored when that time comes. Um, so I want to tell you that's my process. I want to focus on your choices, giving you total assurance, giving you peace of mind, giving you that comfort. That's my process with my clients. I don't want to give them a cookie cutter approach. Um, I don't want to operate as an order taker. I want to educate them about um, the different options that they have and make recommendations. Um, and so I want to give you some of that education today so you can start thinking about some of the um ways you might want to approach this for yourself and your family. So when was the last time you reviewed your existing estate and business plan? And a lot of you are going to say, I don't have a plan. And my kind of sassy answer is, oh, yes, you do. The state of Georgia or whatever state you're in has a plan for you. There is a legal default plan um, that will direct how your assets are distributed distributed and how things go. And a lot of people are really surprised as to what those defaults are. For instance, in Georgia, a lot of people might assume, well, I've been married to this woman for 40 something years. You know, of course she's gonna get everything that I own. She's my spouse. Well, that is not the law in Georgia. The law in Georgia is that um, she would only get up to half and at a minimum a third um, she would share in the estate, this is if you don't have a will, saying otherwise, she would share in the estate with your adult children. So sometimes people think, oh, well, I, I wrote a will and I left everything to my kids because I don't want my wife from a second marriage to get anything. Well, there is a law in the state of Georgia called years support and a spouse if you are legally married to her at the time that you die, it doesn't matter what your will says, she can petition the court for what's called year support. 
and she can claim some property and she gets to state what that property is that she wants. And a lot of times that property ends up being the marital home. And for those of you that farm, the marital home is usually right there where your business is. So your kids from a prior marriage may not want their stepmom living right in the middle of the family farm. And that's the reason you wrote the will that way, but that's not the way that it's actually gonna play out. You've never had a lawyer explain that to you um, because they operated as an order taker instead of educating you about what the potential outcomes were. So I tell everybody, you have a plan. It may not be a plan you've chosen, it's one that's been chosen for you. And that's why it's very important to me that people make the choices for themselves rather than have those choices made by someone else. So we're gonna talk about some of those choices that you can make. Okay, so the pitfalls of no planning. You may avoid going to probate court. You may avoid estate taxes. You're gonna typically leave assets to your heirs unprotected. I'm gonna talk a little bit more in a minute about why that's something to, th something to think about. You don't have ongoing legal guidance. So maybe you did a will or a plan, you know, back when uh, Reagan was in the White House and it talked about you know, who was gonna take care of your little kids. And now those little kids have kids, grown kids of their own, you know, so that you don't have any ongoing legal guidance. It, it hasn't been freshened up. Um, we're also gonna talk about, we wanna avoid potential loss of your assets to the State Department of Unclaimed Property. So um, we want a plan that's gonna work when your family needs it. So those are the pitfalls of no planning is that there's a lot that's left uh, up to chance. So the power of planning, is you make informed, empowered decisions. You're gonna save your family thousands of dollars by making decisions on the front end. Those decisions sometimes are hard to make, but you're gonna save your family a lot of money by you making them instead of leaving them up to be squabbled over potentially. So your assets are not gonna be lost upon your death. because You're gonna have titled them appropriately and be able to know with pretty high degree of certainty how they're gonna pass after your death. You're gonna protect your family money from outsiders. So that might mean your kids' spouses that you don't trust 100%. It might mean creditors. Um, it could mean other business partners. Um, you're gonna have a lifetime of right legal and financial choices. And you're gonna keep your family out of court and conflict. So you wanna plan that will work when your family needs it to work. So the state's state plan for you is a process called probate if you die and it's called guardianship if you became incapacitated. This is another um, problem with uh, you know lack of estate planning or lack of you know planning at all is that people plan traditional estate planning has really only planned for death. So people are you know they have a will. Well a will does not come into effect at all um, I mean, it's in effect, it's, it's a legally valid document, but it's not a document that has any um, real power behind it until the person passes away. Well, statistically, more and more of us are going to experience some time, temporary, permanent um, time of incapacity, whether that's physical or mental incapacity. So I have clients come and they're like, you know, we've had to move dad into an assisted living home and we need to sell his house or something or other to be able to um, pay for that assisted living care. And um, I'm like, well, okay, so do you have a power of attorney that gives you the ability to do that? Well, no, but it says in his will that he's doing whatever with the house. And I was like, well, that doesn't mean anything because he hasn't passed away. So the will doesn't give us any power at all. So what you would have to do is you'd have to go to the probate court and basically sue your own dad declaring that he is mentally incompetent and ask the probate court to appoint you or you know someone, your siblings, and maybe your siblings or maybe your dad's second wife are gonna argue about this. They wanna be the one in control. And so at a minimum, the state is gonna appoint your dad an attorney of his own to make sure that you aren't trying to take advantage of your dad. Um, and y'all have probably all seen this either close or from a little bit from a distance with friends, but a lot of times incapacity, dementia, what have you, is not, it's not a light switch. It's not like one day they're great and the next day they 
you know, don't remember who you are, it's usually a, a gradual decline. And sometimes it's a yo-yo back and forth. And a lot of times the person who's experiencing the incapacity is the last one to recognize it or be willing to admit it because we all like control. And so that court process for guardianship can end up being a really ugly contested thing. Um, but there's a way to avoid that. If you do some planning in advance um, and give some people in your life, some authority to be able to help you. And again, you're making the choice. Who do you want to help you instead of someone you don't necessarily know, the probate judge making that decision for you. So back to the slide, take the the state's plan for you. If you're incapacitated, it's called guardianship. If you've passed away, it's called probate. So I use this little picture just to show you that it's a slow, expensive process. You have attorney's fees dripping out. You have executor's fees dripping out. You have appraiser's fees dripping out, filing fees to the court, creditors making claims, bond premiums. Um, so there's a quote that a probate is like a lawsuit you file against yourself with your own money for the benefit of your creditors. So like right now I have brother and sister, they're grown um, and they're administering their dad's estate and they have to wait to make sure there's no potential creditors before they can take any money out of the estate. Even though their dad left them everything, they've got to make sure that their dad doesn't owe anyone else anything. So meanwhile, they're having to pay for stuff out of pocket because the only real asset that their dad has is a house. And so they're having to pay for stuff out of their own pocket because they can't sell the house yet um, until, or they can't use the money um, yet for the house uh, to be able to pay themselves because they have to make sure that the creditors can pay first. So there's definitely a lot of reasons that you want to avoid this uh, if you can. All right. So it's also, if you, um, Traditional estate planning with just wills is completely public record. You could go down to your probate court in your county and you could ask to see the will of pretty much anybody. And it would, you know, it has inventories of assets, it has beneficiaries, it has all kinds of information. That's not something that I want to be public. Um, some of us have very private reasons for doing certain things and that's not something we want to be public record. So that's another thing to think about. Um, do these two kids look like they're ready to receive any assets outright and unprotected? Um, you know, I have four daughters, like Todd said, and they, the oldest is 10, and then I have one about to be nine, I have one that's six, and I have one that just turned two, four daughters. Um, and I, you know, they're children right now. And so if I left them an asset uh, in the will outright, they cannot receive it. Children who are minors who are under 18 are not allowed to essentially own their own money over a you know, very nominal threshold. A court would appoint a custodian um, or a trustee to be over their money. Now, a lot of you are like, well, in the will, I say that, you know, we're going to have so-and-so be the trustee. But a lot of people don't realize that if they've named their children as beneficiaries of a life insurance policy or maybe a retirement account or something else like that, then that money passes outside of probate. And so if that money is, if their child is named and the child's gonna inherit it outright unprotected, and then the probate court is again, going to appoint a custodian. So do you want to be the one that chooses who would be over your money that you're leaving for your children? Because we all have those family members who you know, you may love them to death, but they're not the most responsible ones with money. And you wouldn't want them being um, handed, you know, maybe a million dollars that you uh, have in life insurance that you want to make sure provides for your kids, you know, for the rest of their lives, because you're not going to be here anymore. And you don't want that money to be in the hands of a family member who may not have any bad intent, but just may not be the most responsible. So again, do you want to make those choices or do you want someone else making those choices for you? Now, maybe your kids, they're over 18, which would mean that if they're 18 years and one day, then the probate court is going to say hands off. They're not going to appoint that custodian. Now, I don't know if any of you think that you were capable of receiving a million dollars when you were 18 and making responsible decisions with it. You know, we some of us might like to think that we would or that our kids would, but Really, that's a huge burden. Um, it really puts a, a target on their back. You know, those years when they're deciding 
what they're going to do with their life. You know, if they receive a million dollars, they might decide not to finish their education or not to pursue uh, a field of training. Or uh, those are times when they're choosing who they're going to marry. Um, and those without any guidance of that kind of money, it just might lead them to make decisions that would affect them for the rest of their lives. So you want um, your beneficiaries receiving assets outright and unprotected, or do you want to put some safeguards around those um, around those assets, you know, until certain ages and stages are met? So these are all things to consider. Some of you may have children who were plenty grown, way over 18, and they still shouldn't receive assets outright and unprotected um, because they haven't made responsible choices in their life, or maybe they... Um, suffer from a disability, and if they receive those assets outright and unprotected, it could affect their benefits. Um, maybe they are in a marriage that the money is going to get used irresponsibly by a spouse. Maybe they're even in business themselves and they're perfectly responsible, but um, they don't want those assets, you know, could affect them and their business. Then they could end up um, becoming attached by creditors if they became the beneficiary's asset, you know, outright. So there's a lot of reasons to think about putting protection in place over those assets. So your minor kids could be at risk even if you have a will. Um, really, you wanna be thinking about, even if you barely have two dimes to rub together, you wanna be thinking about who you would nominate to take care of your kids. May not be the same person you put in charge of the money, um, you know your children, you know your family, you know the home that would provide your children with the most stable environment. Um, and sometimes that's not who, you know, might assume it. Or one set of grandparents assumes they would, the other set of grandparents assumes they would. Um, you don't want to put your family through that if something were to happen to you. So you want to nominate guardians for your minor kids, um, and you want to make sure they're willing to do that. Uh, and that they're empowered with the right documentation to take care of your kids if something happened to you, even if you didn't pass away, but if you just got incapacitated temporarily, that they would, your kids would not go into, um, you know, defects or foster care because you got into a car accident and you weren't there to pick them up from school. You know, the school has an obligation to call the police. And if the police can't reach you, then they have an obligation to call defects. So, you want to know that you've put temporary guardians and um, long-term guardians in place for your minor kids. So let's talk about health, your health care directive. Um, you know, you have wishes. Maybe some of you have walked through this with a family member and you've seen um, it's really difficult when families disagree about whether, um, you know, people use the phrase, pull the plug, and I want to throw that whole phrase out the window because it's really not about pulling the plug. It's about deciding whether to allow the person's body to do what it's going to do naturally. You know, all of us have our going, our bodies are going to wear out at some point. Are we going to allow our bodies to do what they do naturally or are we going to intervene? That's really the better way to think about it. And maybe you want your family to intervene on your behalf, um, but maybe you want if if you're at a certain point with a certain illness, you want to be allowed to pass away in peace, you want to be allowed to pass away at home, um, whatever your wishes are. You want to put those into directives and you really give your family a lot of peace of mind because you've already said, and so they don't have to argue about, are we being mean to mom, mom? They just see what you want. Um, and maybe you have really specific wishes about where you'd like to be buried and other things like that. So you want to focus on healthcare directives. And again, that's uh, these are things that are going to affect you during your life, not just after your death. All right, common planning techniques that don't always work. Some people think that they can do kind of quick and dirty estate planning, and there are times when that is okay, but it's not something to really rely on. So some people say, well, I own this property jointly. Well, you know, that can be a problem. You own the property jointly with, um, you know, a spouse, and then that means that that spouse is going to get the property completely, and maybe your kids end up getting disinherited, even though that's not really what you meant, because you own the property jointly with a spouse, right, a survivorship, that property passes all completely over um, to the spouse, and, you know, none of it goes to the kids. It doesn't go through your will. Um, so a lot of times people don't realize that D, you have to look at deed and policies that comes to the second point designating a beneficiary you have to look at insurance policies retirement accounts 
wheels, um, all of these things, you have they kind of work together and you want to make sure they match. Um, sometimes you could have one saying one thing and another one saying another thing and you got to know which one's going to go in priority. Basically deeds and insurance policies are like a contract. So they're going to be looked at first. So even if your will says I'm leaving everything to my current wife, if your insurance policy says you're leaving everything to your ex-wife, then in Georgia, the insurance company could care less what your will says. The insurance company is going to pay that insurance policy to your ex-wife because you never came back and changed it. Um, so that's, it's really important that all of those things match and are cohesive um, and are updated the way you want to. All right, so relying on trust schedules. If you do a trust, sometimes people just let me kind of make a list of like, these are all the things I want to go into my trust instead of going asset by asset and really figuring out how to fund those into the trust. Um, it's kind of a, a cheating way that doesn't really, uh, you know, serve, serve you well in the long run. Okay, so the only foolproof way uh, to avoid court and conflict for your family um, is to have a fully funded living trust. Some of those people say instead of living, they say revocable with some disability provisions that could kick in if needed. So if an attorney is going to do that for you, you want them to not only do the trust, but you want them to walk you through retitling your investment account so that it, they go into the trust. You want to um, sign new signature cards at the bank so that your bank accounts would pass into the trust. You want to execute deeds to real property so that those would be in the trust. You want to transfer stock and bond certificates. You want to sign your personal property, which is like your stuff. And you want to make sure those beneficiary designations match um, in regards to what you've said in the trust. So this is a pretty comprehensive process. Um, and a lot of lawyers that you just go in and sign a will, they are not going to go over all of this um, with you. Um, but and maybe that's what, but just because you said, I, you know, Joe, I need a will. And so that's what I mean by operating as an order taker is he's going to give you what you asked for. But is he going to explain to you why that may not be enough? Um, and, you know, some of you are thinking, whoa, this might be really expensive. Uh, it is a little bit more than you would pay to just get a will. But in the long run, this is where I say it's going to save your family thousands of dollars because you will have kind of done some of this work on the front end. And then they're not going to have to do near as much kind of clean up at the at the back end. Um, so, okay, who else wants to protect their inheritance completely? Do you like that idea of making sure your children don't lose their inheritance to a new spouse or a lawsuit? And so, those are some things that you want to consider in the trust. Give you your kids or your beneficiaries that number one best form um, of asset protection that will work. Okay, what about estate taxes? That's a big question that a lot of people have. Okay, what you can't know may cost your family big. So the current estate tax exemption right now is $11.7 million per person. And if you're married, the second to die gets to double that. So it's $23.4 million per couple. Um, and, you know, a lot of us are thinking, well, I'm nowhere near that. Um, and if you're over that, then good for you. Um, but if you're not anywhere near that, you still have to pay attention to this because this amount sunsets. It's a fancy word for ends in 2025. And the estate tax rate right now is 40%. So anything over that 23.4 million, 40% of it off the top is going to go to the United States Treasury for estate taxes. Now, Georgia doesn't have estate taxes. I don't know about all the states that some of you may be in. But 40% off the top would go to the United States government. Nothing would go to Georgia for estate taxes. Now, an estate may owe taxes from you know, years prior, but it won't be a state taxes for the state of Georgia. Now, Biden, can't, we don't know exactly what he's going to do because he's not in office yet. Um, and he campaigned on a tax plan that would reduce the exemption amount to $3.5 million and increase the top rate for the estate to 45%. But we don't know exactly, you know, what would happen, but any changes that are going to be made to us are political crapshoot. And I just, like to think, do you trust Washington with your family's estate tax future? I mean, I don't trust Washington to tie their shoes, right? So, you know, you have to, I tell people the estate tax right now, it's, it's in the car, but it's not the driver of the car. But given what could happen, it could switch over and become the driver of estate planning again at any time. And we would have to uh, recommend different things to different clients.
Okay, so assets being lost to the State Department of Unclaimed Property. The total assets that are lost in Georgia is over $1 billion. So these things can include, you know, wages that you never got, savings accounts, customer refunds, accounts payable, insurance payments, shares of stock, escrow funds, royalties, safety deposit box contents. Most times it's whatever institution, so say it was, you know, Bank of America had a safety deposit box for Joe Smith, and he didn't come and um, access that safety deposit box for five years, and he never came and paid for it. Usually if you pay, even if you don't go into it, they don't care as long as, you know, they can see that you're paying. But if you didn't pay and you don't come do it, then they're going to turn that over to the um, Georgia Department of Revenue, to the Department of Unclaimed Property. And so that's what could happen to your assets after you die, because maybe your family has no idea that you have a bank account in the next county over because you used to, you know, be in Rotary Club with that guy. Um, and so, you know, that money could just end up getting turned over um, to the Department of Unclaimed Property. Uh, you can get it back from the Department of Unclaimed Property. It's this whole rumple stiltskin process. You got to give them like all this crazy information, but you can get it back. In fact, that was really fun. I'll tell you all a quick thing. Um, my one of my best friends i was researching uh oh my gosh our presentation is scheduled to end in five minutes uh okay sorry uh so um she uh i was able to tell her that there was ten thousand dollar savings bond in the alabama department of unclaimed property that she was able to go and claim um so uh all right so are you financially and legally organized? Does your family know how to get to the assets that you have, where they are, and how to get access to them personally and for your business? Um, okay, so what about your values, your insights, your stories and experiences? You know, we have to think, we worry so much about our stuff that we don't always worry about our legacy. Um, a lot of you have values, you have insights, stories, experiences, maybe even related to your farm and your business. And those things are much more important to your family and who gets that thousand dollars that's over in that other uh, account. And so uh, I like to tell people, don't just worry about your stuff. Um, make sure that you're passing on your intangible legacy. So now we're gonna start talking about the ag business succession planning. Um, and we're gonna ask some tough questions. So I'm guessing for most of you, your farm or your business is your largest asset. So what would its value be without you there to run it? Could you weather losing a crop because you died or became incapacitated in the middle of a critical time? Is your spouse or are your kids capable of running the farm right now? Do they all want to? Um, are you in business with partners, family members or otherwise? Do you want to be partners with any of their spouses if your partner died or became incapacitated? Do they with yours? All right, are you feeling uncomfortable? Is thinking about this stressing you out? Well, imagine how stressed your kids will be when they're fighting among their siblings about how to continue the farm if some siblings could care less about farming. Imagine how stressed your kids from your first marriage will be when they learn that your second wife inherits at least a third of your estate, including your farm interest, if they you do not have a will, and that that second wife may possibly inherit your house even if you do have a will. Um, so imagine how stressed you will be trying to work with your partner's grief-stricken widow because she's now your partner in the farm. So succession is more about planning the future of the farm. At its heart, succession planning is about preserving an agricultural legacy and the heirs who inherit it. So that's a quote from a resource that I'm gonna give you. So you are not alone if you're feeling uncomfortable and you don't have a plan in place for this. 73% of American farmers have no succession plan in place. We are all living in fantasy land that we're gonna live forever and we're never gonna need to do any of this. You're all so busy farming, keeping things going, barely enough time to sleep and eat in some seasons. So stuff like this that you don't want to think about falls to the bottom of the list. But you gotta think of succession planning like your crops. They don't pop up lush and ready for market overnight. There are numerous steps along the way. So we'll talk about some of those steps that you can begin taking now for the future of your family and your farm. So some things to consider. You cannot treat 
farming kids and non-farming kids exactly equal, okay? You may have to consider splitting your farming and non-farming assets between your heirs. So let go of trying to make everything equal between your kids. Work for fair but equal. Decide which of your heirs is most interested and capable of running the farm and focus on leaving those farm assets to him or her or maybe them and leave other heirs non-farm assets, even if the values are not exactly equal. You wanna also consider dividing the farm. Um, maybe you have multiple kids who are involved in the farm on some level, but you know that if you were gone, they would not jive. They have different visions for the farm. Um, maybe you need to think about splitting your farm into some smaller entities to pass on now so that each of those kids or heirs will be able to be in control of their smaller piece of the farming operation. Um, some other things to consider. You need to address life's uncertainties. So divorce, illness, legal troubles, financial troubles, kids from prior marriages, second marriages. Um, you know, all of these things are things we did wish weren't the case, but no life is perfect. Um, and so we have to address some of those uncertainties. So four, we wanna minimize tax burdens. Farmers are more than twice as likely to owe estate taxes as non-farmers because your assets are high but your cash is not usually always high. So you wanna figure this out in advance so your family can reduce the tax burden and prepare for what the tax burden might be. Um, five, you wanna plan for retirement or incapacity. So if you've passed on your farm to your kids at retirement, does that mean that you don't have a place to live anymore because the homestead was there? What's your income gonna be? How are you gonna pay your health care or long-term care cost? Um, so these are all things you want to consider when you're talking about succession planning. So steps to take. All right, schedule a family meeting. This means family, spouses, children, partners. Discuss your future goals for the farm and your personal goals, such as retirement. Find out which of them want to be part of the farm long-term and which of them plan to go off to New York City. Um, or somewhere far away. So you might even need to bring in a professional farm coach or another advisor to help you facilitate. Um, two, put together your dream team. You know, an accountant you trust, an insurance agent, lawyer, a banker. You're gonna need professionals to accomplish a lot of this succession planning. So choose people that you really trust, not only their ability, but their ability to understand and carry out your vision. Um, three, you wanna set goals for succession. So it's hard to put a plan together with no target date and other people may need time to prepare financially or even professionally. Maybe they need to gain more expertise before taking over. Um, and so you need to get everybody's buy-in for those goals and that timeline um, so that the plan becomes a reality. So make a list of your assets, what they are, where they are, how they are titled or owned. This goes for farm assets and non-farm assets. You need to make a list of your debts. Eee. Be gut level honest, because your heirs need to know what they are inheriting. Nothing could harm your legacy or potentially your farm more than your kids finding out after you died that you were not nearly as financially successful as they thought and that they are inheriting a lot of liabilities rather than an asset. They need to be prepared for that so that y'all can um, you know, make a plan ahead of time. So six, you wanna gather all existing documents. So deeds, insurance policies, account statements, wills, trust, powers of attorney, corporate documents, contact information for any agents or people involved, account access, passwords. You wanna have all of this together um, in a way that someone would be able to not only find the needles in the haystack, but be able to find the haystacks. Um, so you wanna make a timeline, like I talked about this before, that all involved agree to. It might take longer than a year to get the plan made. It might even take a decade or more to carry out the plan. That's fine, as long as you are not just kicking the can down the road, um, that you have actionable items that everybody has agreed to. And if the timeline gets there and they're not ready to move, then you have another plan and you have a contingency and you're continuing to move forward. Eight just do it. Don't get paralyzed by pondering. Well, if Johnny would just get his life straight, or if Susie would move back closer to home, or Billy will change his mind about wanting to farm, 
these dreams for your family may not happen. There's often not a perfect solution and magical thinking does not serve you well. You need to be realistic and accept that, as a, accept that a decision that you make is almost always better than one made for you by a court or a bank after you are gone. So I gave you some resources here to review. These were several articles that I found um, just to help kind of uh, boil down my years of doing this into some bullet points. Um, and so uh, I put these here. Maybe you can um, cut and paste them real quick into an email to yourself or something so that you could look these up later. Uh, they were good articles, food for thought. So when you are making your personal estate plan, this is kind of my summary here, and your business succession plan, these are the things that I want you to look at. And if you're interviewing an attorney, um, whether it's in your town or you know maybe you wanna go a little further afield to keep your business private, um, these are the things I want you to ask if they're prepared to discuss with you and to talk about. As part of their process, inventorying your assets to ensure that none are lost. Do they talk about naming guardians for minor children if you have them? Do they walk you through health care directives and naming who your choice, if you had to have a guardian appointed by the probate court over yourself, if you were incapacitated, do they walk you through that? Do they talk about helping you do HIPAA releases so that your family can have access to your medical information when they need it? Um, do they do powers of attorney for you that are going to give um, trusted people power over your personal assets and then also in regards to your business assets. Are they going to plan for incapacity and death? And are they going to act on that plan with funding? Are they going to guide you in doing that? Are they going to talk to you about passing on your intangible wealth? Are they going to coordinate and plan for any business interests that you have? Are they going to help you um, communicate with your family about choices. That's one thing that I've started doing with my clients and my clients really love it is I either help them have a family meeting or I write what I call fiduciary letters. So at the end of the process, I send a letter out to their kids or maybe it's nieces and nephews or siblings or whatever. And I say, I've had the pleasure of helping Mr. and Ms. Jones with their estate planning and there's nothing you need to do right now, but I just wanted to introduce myself and let you know I'm here and I have copies of their documents if and when anything happens to them. Um, and that way they feel a little bit more a part of the process. They know mom and dad have taken care of estate planning and they know who I am. So they feel like they have a connection a little bit with me um, and then they can reach out to me uh, as time goes on. And I do, I retain documents of all, uh, copies of all my clients' documents um, so I have people that say, hey, I'm at the bank and I need that power of attorney and I'm able to email or fax it right over to them. Um, it gives them a lot of convenience. So you want to know if your lawyer is going to uh, kind of be situated to help you and your family. Um, is your lawyer set up to adjust your plan as needed over the course of your life? You know, estate planning is not a static situation. It's going to change just like your life's going to change. Um, and does that lawyer have a team that is going to help your family carry out that plan when the time comes? Um, or are they going to, are they prepared um, to have someone else do it? Like I'm a solo practitioner in my firm. And so I have to have a plan for what if something happens to me so that my clients would be able to have the benefit of the work that I've done for them, that it would be passed on to someone else. So these are things that you want to um, make sure that your lawyer is prepared to do. You know, a lot of lawyers would just give you a will, like I said, but um, for those of you that have agriculture related businesses and um, a lot of different things going on, it needs to be more uh, involved a lot of times than just a simple kind of drive through will situation. So um, I hope that I have given you food for thought and I am available. We're going to, like I Todd said before, this is being pre-recorded, so it's kind of weird that I'm not ready to answer your questions right now, but I look forward to uh, actually on my birthday, January 5th, when this presentation is scheduled, um, we're going to have a live Q&A time, um, and you will be able to ask me your questions then, and I'll be there on the chat, and I look forward to um, 
talking to you in that Q&A time and also just talking to you anytime in the future. My law firm, I'm located in St. Simons, but I have clients all over the state of Georgia. I meet with some of them virtually, meet with a lot of them in person. Um, and I really enjoy helping uh, not only families and small business owners, but farmers uh, get these kind of things in place. Um, so they can pass on their legacy and to people that are going to be prepared to steward the land um, and that they are making sure their family is taken care of. My, I think my catchphrase slogan is helping you to of who and what you love the most. And that is what gives me a lot of purpose and joy in my professional life. And I look forward to helping any of you that need it. And I've enjoyed being here with you today. Thank you.